Welcome to Studio 51. I'm Wendy Esparza. And I'm Jason Weeder. Studio 51 is a weekly news magazine produced by Loyola University students in Chicago. Our name is Studio 51 because we are located on 51 East Pearson in this beautiful street studio in downtown Chicago. And it is beautiful. It's starting to look a lot like spring as we begin the Easter week. We've got a fun and fascinating show for you, a new summary, Sports Chicago style. And have you heard about Cheryl Sandberg's book, Lean In, yet? We'll have a closer look about the controversy it's stirring up. That and more. Our foodie this week takes a different look at pizza. We debate the Chicago public school closings in our Point Counterpoint, and that's the lead of the story of our news roundup. Here's Studio 51's Newsbeat reporter, Katie Knuckles. Some people say it was 2,000. Chicago police say it was around 100. By anyone's estimate, it was big. Protesters flooded the downtown loop Wednesday, marching to protest the closing of 54 Chicago public schools. Police detained 127 protesters and ticketed them. The sit-in and march at Daly Plaza was to protest Mayor Rahm Emanuel's decision to close the schools in what protesters called predominantly African-American communities. Chicago's teacher union president Karen Lewis called the closings at these schools racist. But Chicago School Superintendent Barbara Bird Bennett says she supports the community's right to express its opinion, but she believes the school district's decision was putting children first. The Chicago public school closings are the subject of this week's Point Counterpoint later on in the show. In other news, all eyes were on the nation's capital this week as the U.S. Supreme Court heard arguments for and against gay marriage. Court observers say the justices are poised to overturn the ban on gay marriage in California. Judging from the arguments, the justices are unlikely to rule on the constitutionality of gay marriage nationwide. It will be June before the decision on whether to ban gay marriage in California is upheld or struck down. Last week at this time, I reported on the Janila Watkins funeral and interviewed several members of the community who attended the, that funeral. While everyone is still mourning the death of the six-month-old, as well as hundreds more who have died from gang violence, some people say we haven't heard enough solutions. Let's get more on this from Studio 51's Wendy Esparza and her special guest. Thank you, Katie. Joining us this week is Dr. Robert Lombardo, 35-year police veteran and professor of criminology here at Loyola University. Dr. Lombardo, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Chicago has had a problem with violence. In the month of January alone, we recorded 40 homicides. What are the reasons for such high crime rates? Well, Chicago has been experiencing a, a very high violent crime rate. And this, the causes are traditionally or typically uh, attributed to gangs in Chicago. And there are probably three major reasons why Chicago, for ex compared to New York, for example, has a higher rate of violence. Uh, a couple of them are, in fact, uh, unanticipated results of some positive experiences, like, for example, the end of public housing. When the Robert Taylor Homes, Cabrini Green, and other places like that were finally torn down in the effort, effort to help the people there, the gangs that were concentrated there were then moved to other territories, other territories where other gangs already existed, and that resulted in conflict. Uh, not only conflict between the gangs, but conflict for, for control of drug markets. The other unanticipated consequence was this increase in violence as a result of uh, effective law enforcement. Uh, the Chicago Police and the federal government together were able to incarcerate the leadership of all the major gangs in Chicago over the last 10 years. This uh, fractionalization of the gangs that resulted also contributed to the increase in violence in that instead of being tightly controlled by strong leadership, the gangs were now fighting amongst themselves. Uh, people within the gangs were fighting amongst themselves. Different what they call sets and crews were fighting for uh, drug territories also and there was no leadership, so to speak. And finally, what I think uh, the, the cause of the vi of violence that's uh, often ignored by the media and people the city doesn't want to talk about are the constant reorganizations of the Chicago Police Department and the reduction of, of manpower and woman power, police officers within the Chicago Police Department. We are now working with about 16, 1,700 less officers on the street than we had two years ago. And many of those officers came from the tactical units that were uh, directly involved in suppressing gang activity. So when you combine all three of these things together, uh, I think we can pretty much explain the spike in violence in Chicago. And within gangs, we have what is called code of silence. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Well, sure. They don't want to snitch, so to speak, on each other. And um, I'm not so sure it's so much of a loyalty thing as it is a 
safety thing. You know, people in the community, even people, the residents of the community, though even those that participate in the program of community policing, people are reluctant to cooperate with the police because when the police leave and go home, these people still have to live in the neighborhood with these dangerous people. And if they're witnesses, informants, if they've signed complaints, the gangs and the criminals will retaliate against them. So the code of silence isn't as much as a loyalty thing as in fact is a, a safety a safety thing for the people that live in these communities. They're afraid. What do you think are some viable solutions? Chicago Police Department just announced that they were going to add more foot patrols to high crime areas. Do you think that will be effective? I think foot patrols in the long run will be helpful. Initially, uh, they could be very dangerous for the officers. I mean, there's a history here in Chicago where we've had uh, officers murdered on foot patrol. Take, for example, right here where Cabrini Green used to be just down the street. Back in the 70s, uh, uh, Severin and Rosado, two police officers were killed by snipers just engaged in foot patrol within public housing. So I think putting foot patrols into high crime, high violence areas until those areas, and I hate to use the term pacified, but until those areas, until the police gain greater control of those areas, I think is a very dangerous proposition. Thank you so much for your insightful oh, you're welcome. Uh, opinions. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, Wendy and Dr. Lombardo. Studio 51 will continue its coverage on Chicago gangs and its code of silence. And someone else who is following this closely is the First Lady Michelle Obama. She has scheduled a tip trip to Chicago for April 10th. While here, she plans to work with Mayor Rahm Emanuel to stop Chicago violence. One of the most controversial books, Lean In, came out this month di that dives into the issue of women in the workplace. Kristen Immel takes a closer look at this topic. Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg released her first book earlier this month. In it, she addresses women's lack of leadership in the workplace. But her advice to women is clear. She wants women to lean in. Her supporters say she's the next Betty Friedan, reigniting a conversation on women's roles in the workplace. Her critics call her out of touch with the needs of middle class women. Loyola's women's and gender study professor, Bren Murphy, partially attributes the glass ceiling to women assuming their roles. That's part of Sandberg's point, is that I, I don't know that she blames women, but she's saying, do you realize how much of this you internalize? And, and, and if that's the case, only you can change that. Professor Murphy thinks the problem with the glass ceiling is multifaceted. While working a full-time job, women often work a second shift at home with household duties and child rearing. Well-meaning men often don't get it. There are still men that refer to taking care of their own children as babysitting. Dean of Loyola's Business School, Kathleen Getz, sees a difference in behavior among male and female students. If I were to talk about eventually becoming a top executive in a company, it would be more likely that a young woman would say, oh, I don't see myself getting there than a young man. Instead of blaming institutions, Sandberg claims women themselves could do more to advance their careers by changing their professional outlook. Getz isn't convinced gender roles and behavior are the only factors holding women back, though. I don't believe that she's entirely wrong, but I do believe she oversimplifies and doesn't recognize that there still are some barriers in place that are really quite difficult. Jennifer Wolf has owned her own photography business for 22 years. Nowbo helps combat these institutions and create a community of professional women. It is certainly a really good unit to go to for support. And sometimes that's all you need is just a little boost. Lean In recently topped the New York Times and Amazon bestseller list. For Studio 51, I'm Kristen Immel. And finally, this weekend, the 135th annual White House Easter Egg Roll will be led by the first dog, Bo. 35,000 people are expected to attend the event. And that's your news roundup for Studio 51. I'm Katie Knuckles. Do either of you guys still do Easter egg hunts with your families? No, unfortunately, I can't remember the last time I did. My parents started putting money in them, so enthusiast make us more enthusiastic about Easter yeah you know my parents stopped doing that a couple years ago <laughs> after they got tired of seeing me and my brother and sister roll around trying to fight for <laughs> money but That's speaking great. of Easter our health reporter is here and I hope it's not to advise us to avoid all of that Easter candy this weekend Caitlin take it away thanks Jason cancer is a fight and more people are winning 
The National Cancer Institute says 18 million people who survive cancer will be living in the United States by the year 2022. According to the report, people are living longer after being diagnosed with cancer. A fourth are still alive after 15 years. Same-sex marriage is before the Supreme Court, but apparently it's also a health issue. Earlier this month, the American Academy of Pediatrics endorsed gay marriage. Doctors say scientific evidence shows that children raised by same-sex parents seem to show the same development as children raised by traditional families. The Academy adds, it is in the best interest of children with gay parents to allow those parents to marry. And finally, conventional wisdom tells us that tea is good for us, but doctors in Detroit are saying it is possible to drink too much. They treated a woman who was missing most of her teeth and feeling excruciating pain in her hips and back. The culprit? Black tea. If consumed in large amounts, the components in black tea can cause bone brittleness. So how much is too much? Reportedly, the woman drank almost a pitcher of tea every day for 17 years. And get this, they were each brewed with 150 tea bags. That's your health news for today. I'm Caitlin Wilson. Back to you, Wendy and Jason. Thank you, Caitlin, for those stories. Coming up after the break, rather than get burned, Chicago teams caught fire themselves this week. Also coming up, our foodie takes us to a unique Chicago pizza location that will have your mouth watering. We'll be back after this break, and by the way, you'll want to take a look at these student-produced PSAs. Life is full of distractions. Some are minor. Crash, look, look who it is. Others are more severe. Hello? Hello. Hi. Is this the Phoenix Loyalist Student Newspaper? Yes. I'm near your headquarters. Mind if I drop in? Absolutely. Our offices are in the basement of the CFSU. Yikes. Where are you? Phoenix? Arizona? You know, becoming a part of the Phoenix isn't that difficult. It's actually quite easy. Give us a call, shoot us an email. Who knows? You might even win yourself one of these bad boys. It could change your life. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We're moving into April, but it would be foolish to think that March Madness is not in full force. Let's get the rundown in sports with 51 seconds with Stephanie Skelnick. Stephanie, take it away. The streak is over. The Chicago Bulls put an end to Miami Heat's 27-game winning streak Wednesday night. The shorthanded Bulls were without stars like Derrick Rose and Joe Kim Noah, but managed to win the game 101-97. In the final seconds, the home crowd chanted, end the streak. The Blackhawks shut out the Calgary Flames on home ice Wednesday night to end a two-game skid. They take on the second-place Anaheim Ducks tonight at the United Center. The Ducks are the only team to have beaten the Hawks more than once this season. Baseball fans, get ready because the season opener is right around the corner. April 1st is opening day for both the White Sox and the Cubs, who were just named by Forbes magazine the fourth most valuable team in baseball, worth an estimated $1 billion. March Madness is in full swing, and this year has been all about the upset. It has been unpredictable, exciting, and definitely a bracket buster. Just ask anyone who picked Gonzaga or Georgetown. Well, I'm out of time, but Dominique Stem has more on the Cinderella team of the NCAA tournament. Thanks, Stephanie. Yes, how about those bulls? But let's talk about Dunk City. Florida Gulf Coast University is this year's Cinderella story. Let's be honest, if you're not watching, if you're not on the Florida Gulf Coast bandwagon, why exactly are you even watching March Madness? Every year we have that one team that comes out, beats the top seed, and surprises everyone. But a 15 seed? That's never been done! On their quest to the Sweet 16, they pulled off the ultimate upset by knocking off number two seed Georgetown in the second round of the tournament and literally dunking all over the place in their win against San Diego State University. I have to be honest, though they've totally thrown off my bracket, I am rooting for them to make it all the way. I always have a soft spot for the under underdog, and the way these guys have been playing and literally dunking all over the place, I think the pressure is on for the number three seed at Florida Gators. Can Dunk City University knock off the Florida Gators and have the whole state rooting for them? I don't know. But I do know one thing. It, 
excuse me, I do know one thing. This game is going to be something to watch as we see Florida Gulf Coast try to make history. I'm Dominique Stem, your sports super fan. Well, a lot of upsets this year, and my pick already lost. Oh, yeah, who is your team? Georgetown. Georgetown? Louisville's totally going to go all the way. So much for the picks. Do you know what goes great with basketball? Pizza. Here's our foodie this week with Sean Keenahan. In a city where pizza is king, there are endless options to find your pie in the sky in Chicago. I decided to pay a visit to Pequod's Pizza, located at Webster and Clybourne in Lincoln Park, to get a taste of Pequod's own original take on Chicago's pizza tradition. Established in 1970, Pequod's offers a full menu of moderately priced appetizers, sandwiches, and desserts, but their pan pizza is the star of the show. Don't be misled by the burnt crust appearance, Pequod's crunchy caramelized cheese crust provides for a fine delicacy that I have not experienced anywhere else. The attentive wait staff at Pequod serves your pizza piping hot out of a blackened iron pan, and despite flat screen TVs and a full official Chicago Blackhawks bar, Pequod's all brick interior and soft lighting gives off a casual dining atmosphere. Stop by Pequod's on weekday afternoons between 11 and 3 to enjoy one of the best lunch deals in Chicago. For $4.95, you get a 7-inch single-topping pan pizza served with your choice of a draft beer or fountain soda. This is not a skimpy personal pizza. Plan to leave the restaurant with leftovers and a full stomach, especially if you choose the draft beer option. Pequod's has over 20 toppings to choose from. I ordered a pan with pepperoni and black olives that was literally life-changing. While everyone raves about Pequod's caramelized crust, I will tell you that their tangy tomato sauce is just as key to the pizza's perfection. I also enjoy Pequod's house salad with crisp romaine lettuce and a zesty house dressing, but the cookie I ordered for dessert was a bit dry. One word of advice, a pan pizza takes roughly 30 minutes to cook. So if you were looking to have a quick meal, I recommend that you do call your order in in advance. You can visit Pequod's online at www.pequodspizza.com. Do your stomach a favor and make a pilgrimage to this Chicago pizza mecca. For Studio 51, I'm your foodie, Sean Keenahan. Thanks, Sean. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, Point Counterpoint will debate the Chicago school closings. Also coming up, when you pick up this week's edition of the Phoenix, don't be fooled. The Phoenix Editor-in-Chief is here to explain. We'll be back after these student-produced PSAs. I really like these. Let's watch. I'm here. Hello. Mom, I'm busy. I can't talk right now, alright? But I love you. I love you too, okay? Talk to you later. Long before we met, my heart was painting you. Now I'm standing here just staring at your face. Oh my god, he was so incredibly rude. I can't even believe I went. He was so not worth my time. I didn't even know what to do. I just left. I was so mad. It made me so much better. Oh my god, are you okay, Olivia? Olivia? Hello? Olivia? I just wanted to spend some time with my family. Who are you talking to? I gotta call my mom. Jacob? No, That's my mom! Right Katie? Hello? Stop. This is your- Look out, Jacob! 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 Welcome back. You know, those are some great spots that really makes you think about texting. It's a very serious issue and another important topic is the announcement earlier, earlier this week of 53 school closings here in Chicago. That's the focus of this week's Point Counterpoint with Mary Sugden and Stephanie Sanford. A hot debate in Chicago is over Rahm Emanuel's proposal to close 54 Chicago public schools. The mayor says the closings are necessary because of under-enrollment and fiscal problems. However, many Chicagoans are confused how these closings will help the education of Chicago school children in struggling communities. Stephanie, what's your take on all of this? Well, Mary, first and foremost, the kids need to be the priority in this situation. The fact of the matter is, the schools that are closing down are underperforming and underenrolled. The kids just aren't getting the best education they deserve. 
And I understand that, but I think my biggest issue with this is the safety. So many of these closings are happening in impoverished areas where there's gang activity. And parents have expressed their concern as far as how their students are going to be getting safely to school. I mean, they're going to be crossing rival gang lines. How are we sure that these students are going to be getting safely to school? Are we just adding fuel to the fire by putting these students in a possibly dangerous situations? If the parents are worried about their children's safety getting to school, they should send them on school buses because that will get them to and from classes in the safest manner. They won't have to walk. And I know we're trying to combat the under-enrollment, but what about the possibility of overpopulation now? I mean, 30,000 students are going to be affected by this. How are we sure that there's going to be enough resources, enough space, and enough attention for all these students with these closings? Well, I'm putting my trust in the mayor and CPS CEO, Barbara Bird Bennett. I'm sure they've gone through all the numbers, and they're going to make sure that each student that goes to a new school will get all the resources they deserve. All right, well, it looks like we're out of time for this week's Point Counterpoint. I'm Mary Sugden. And I'm Stephanie Sanford. Join us next week as we heat up or cool down on another controversial topic. Thank you, Stephanie and Mary. Finally, a very strange edition of this week's Phoenix. None of it is true. My co-anchor, Jason, interviews the editor-in-chief to get to the bottom of this. Thanks, Wendy. And we're joined this week with uh, Tara Rahman, who's the editor-in-chief of the Loyola Phoenix. Tara, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Now, I have to um, notice that the Phoenix looks a little different this week. What's going on? Well, that's because it's the Kleenex issue, our annual April Fool's issue. It's sort of modeled after The Onion, which is another satirical publication. That's very interesting. Now, how long has the Phoenix been running the Kleenex? Well, our first Kleenex issue came out in 1971, um, and it actually wasn't meant to be an April Fool's issue, Jason. It was actually a, the last issue of the year. Now, how popular has it been with the readers at Loyola? I would say, just from what I've seen or overheard in my past three years at the Phoenix and other staff members, it's gotten really good pickup. We've gotten really good feedback, nothing but good feedback, actually. And I even overheard um, some students talking and saying they wish that it was longer. So who knows, maybe next year we'll make it a little longer for you guys. Now, I have to know, has anything that has been published in the, in the Kleenex, has anybody mistook uh, that for what they would normally see in the Phoenix? Yeah, actually, there's been some confusion among students. Um, some of our editors, after this issue, noticed in their classes, um, students being like, wait, has Loyola actually brought the John Hancock Center? And they're really confused. So you kind of just have to laugh and then set them straight and be like, hey, this is actually a joke issue. Well, OK, then. Tahera, thank you for joining us. You can pick up this week's copy of the Kleenex around newsstands around Loyola. And that's our show for this week. I'm Jason Weeder. And I'm Wendy Esparza. Just a reminder, we want to hear your thoughts about the show and what you think. You can email us at studio51news at gmail.com or you can tweet us at studio51news. And a happy Easter to everybody. We'll see you next week.